Hello and welcome to India's World. A year ago, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's neighborhood first policy was hailed by all as a radical approach to India's South Asian neighbors. However, in 2015, somehow a perception has gained ground that the policy has not delivered on its potential. India's Nepal policy has been a spectacular failure. With Pakistan, the government has taken the nation on an emotional roller coaster ride, blowing hot and cold with no credible public explanation for either. In Afghanistan, Pakistan has once again occupied center stage, trying to broker peace between Kabul and the Taliban. Maldives is going down a slip, slippery political slope, and neighboring countries are being warned against interference. If there was some forward movement, it was in India's ties with Bangladesh and Bhutan, while relations with Sri Lanka have more or less come on to an even keel. To discuss the state of India's relationship with its South Asian neighbors in 2015, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Lalit Mansingh, a distinguished diplomat. He is India's former foreign secretary and has been India's ambassador to the United States and the UAE and high commissioner to the UK and Nigeria. We have with us Ambassador Kaval Sibyl, a formidable diplomat. He was also foreign secretary of India, has served as India's ambassador to Turkey, Egypt, France and Russia. And then we have with us Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee, another distinguished diplomat. He's been India's High Commissioner to the UK and South Africa and Ambassador to Egypt and Nepal. I welcome you gentlemen to this discussion. Uh, Ambassador Man Singh, let me begin with you. What are the main elements of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's <coughs> vision for, its, for India's South Asian neighbours? And how successful has he been in actualizing that vision? Well, I, I'd like to make a distinction here between the style of Mr. Modi and his policy. Uh, his policy is no different from the policy of his predecessors. And if you look at the neighborhood, the changes in our approach to the neighborhood started much earlier, let's say with the Gujarat doctrine during Mr. Gujarat's time, and Mr. Vajpayee's focus on the neighborhood. Dr. Manmohan Singh actually articulating a policy on the neighborhood when he talked about uh, the asymmetrical relations that we must accept with our neighborhood. So I don't think there's any change in policy. But there is definitely a change in style in diplomacy. And that is Mr. Modi's hallmark. I don't mean any disrespect, but I think Mr. Modi is India's first Bollywood prime minister. The emphasis on the script, the setting, the crowd scenes, the intimate scenes, and so on, and the twist in the tape. But is it working? Um, I, I disagree that it's a spectacular failure. It is a difficult task. In fact, if diplomacy has to be tested anywhere, it is in our neighborhood, and it's not easy. But he has started well. The only exception I would uh, agree with you is, has been Nepal. That's, that's what I call a spectacular failure, yeah, not his yeah. neighborhood policy. But overall, it has begun well and has ended well. Okay. It started, his foreign policy started with a big success with uh, Barack Obama's visit to India, has ended with Moscow, Kabul, and Lahore. Okay. I think it's a, it's a good story. Okay. Ambassador Sibyl, uh, you know, sticking to the neighborhood, why is it that whether it is Nepal, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka or Maldives, during 2015, at some point or the other, uh, India was perceived by them as taking a, a hard, muscular position against them, legitimizing certain political forces, ignoring others and trying to meddle in their internal affairs? Well, I, I don't think it's quite true across the board. I don't think uh, we particularly sought to interfere in the internal affairs of Bangladesh during Prime Minister Modi's uh, tenure. And if at all, the fact that we signed the line boundary agreement and in the process strengthened the hands of uh, Sheikh Hasina is seen as interference in internal affairs would be a wrong We legitimized an election which was boycotted by the main political party. But that's party. not for us uh, to, to legitimize or not legitimize. We have never undertaken a crusade for democracy anywhere in the world. We have our democracy, we are satisfied with it, we know what its flaws are, and it's not up to us to lecture others on democracy. This has been a consistent policy uh, for a very long time. In the case of Sri Lanka, we tolerated a lot uh, the provocations from Raja Pakse uh, without, in fact, um, reacting to it uh, the way uh, the previous government had reacted. And in fact, uh, Raja Pakse was invited uh, to the swearing-in ceremony and then visits have taken place and subsequently we change in government. We have a better understanding with the Sirisena government. In Maldives, we have not interfered. In fact, some people may say, why are you allowing the situation to drift in the way it is drifting and you must exert your weight and counsel them and put them on the right path. Insofar as Nepal is concerned, these are very special circumstances yep. which we can go into later why there is a perception 
And this perception will always remain because the Madeshis are looked upon as semi-Indians or Indians, and there is this rift, internal rift, uh, political, ethnic, and otherwise. And inevitably, India will be drawn open border and stuff. So far as Pakistan is concerned, we have no capacity to interfere in their internal affairs, frankly. So I don't buy the argument that okay. either that we have had a muscular policy or that we have sought to interfere. Yes, we have reacted strongly in the case of in Nepal. And yep. that's the, about the only thing that uh, we have done which okay. could be called muscular. Okay, so let's talk about Nepal, Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee. Um, despite India's huge relief effort, you know, within six hours of the earthquake, you know, uh, Indian uh, army and uh, uh, supplies on Indian army's uh, cargo planes were there uh, in Nepal. Huge announcements were made for relief, etc. How is it that after such goodwill and such good neighborly uh, relations, uh, when, you know, we find ourselves in a tangle in Nepal? Well, uh, I'll say uh, qu quite flatly that this is not, uh, not only not a spectacular failure in our diplomacy in Nepal, it's not a failure at all. The fact that, uh, I mean, everyone is pointing to the fact that we had a huge amount of goodwill after we supported democracy uh, in, in, you know, after the king's takeover in 2005. And as you mentioned, the, the enormous uh, effort that we made after the earthquake. But... It is internal developments in Nepal that have brought, up, brought Nepal and Indo-Nepal relations to the present uh, situation. You have a situation there where an unholy alliance of uh, the Bahun Chetri Pahari nexus wants to continue its domination over the half of Nepal, that is the Madhesh. And we have a perfectly legitimate right to express our opinion on this, a negative opinion on this, because, uh, and this is nothing to do with interfering in Nepal's process or trying to, to, to remote control their constitution, but because the, the Madeshis quite predictably agitate for their rights, rights that they were guaranteed in written agreements starting from 2007 and 2008, and the agitation leads to a situation which spills across the open border into India. So A, we have a legitimate grievance in terms of pointing out the flaws in the constitution that have led to it. We are right in pointing out that it's a political problem that has to be solved politically by the Nepali ruling elite. And uh, apart from government statements, the fact is that this is a, this is a situation internally in Nepal that cannot stand. Okay. And therefore, what we have done, including incidentally the so-called unofficial blockade, which is a blockade that has, you know, journalist after journalist has, uh, have, have been there and, and, and seen the fact that... Uh, in the main crossing points, it's Amadeshi agitation that is doing the blockade. We've also gone the extra mile, and this is on record, uh, in terms of, you know, sending in medicines and so on, in spite of the blockade, at some risk to ourselves, including an offer to airlift medicines if they want. So I would say that it is not only not a spectacular failure, it is a development that happened. It happened because of the short-sightedness and, yeah. okay. and the feeling of entitlement that a certain set point. of people have. I, I, I think and we have to react to it. You made your point. Uh, it's, a, it's a point of view which uh, I suppose the government of India would be very happy with. But this is not how... It, no, is, it just happens it, it to be the perceived. fact. That's all. Anyway, we need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing the state of India's relations with its South Asian neighbours in the year 2015. You wanted to say something on Nepal. Yes, uh, I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, it's, I don't think Nepal is, a, is an instance of spectacular failure of policy. I think the policy is sound. The spectacular failure was in, in the PR field, in the perception yeah. that it got in the media. That the, if we had a good story, yeah. that good story was not Positive. reflected in the media. Okay, but the way the story is being perceived, what impact do you think it's having in Thimpu? Do you think it's sending a chill uh, in the hearts well, of the Bhutanese because they're equally dependent on see, trade and transit? It's to bound to send a chill because the contrast between Mr. Modi's highly successful visit to uh, Nepal twice and then this happening is going to create a problem in saying, is he really the same man? Who is, who is directing policy towards us. Yes, it, it, the conflict is so obvious that it is going to create uh, problems with our neighbours. But let's hope it doesn't happen with Bhutan because oh, yeah. that's one of our uh, mm -hmm. time-tested trends. That's right. Yeah, but you know, Bhutan is not uh, following provocative policies. It, to my mind, it is the only country in our region which is following sensible policies towards India, yeah. not unnecessarily provoking India. Yeah. 
taking the maximum benefits from the India relationship, etc., etc. Yeah. So there's no reason for them no. to fear, yeah. uh, unless, of course, they have the developed the same kind of uh, hostility, political hostility, which is almost endemic in certain classes in yeah. Nepal, yeah. which is unlikely to happen in, what I uh, in, in to, Bhutan. I want to ask you about Pakistan. What explains uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, flip-flop and U-turns on Pakistan? Uh, you know, one day you don't want to talk about all the issues and talk only about terrorism. Suddenly you say, oh, our national security advisors have met and now we'll talk about everything, including Kashmir. And then you have this ex unexplained stopover in Lahore and, you know, you go and hug Mr. Nawaz Sharif on his birthday. Uh, so, you know, uh, why does the entire nation have to go on this emotional roller coaster ride without knowing why uh, they are in this ride in the first place? I think this is a legitimate uh, critique that you have made of uh, the policy that we are pursuing towards Pakistan because there doesn't seem to be any plausible explanation uh, for these U-turns. Yeah. And it's not very clear what we hope to achieve, apart from generating uh, a perception of goodwill and easing atmosphere yeah. in the immediate. Okay. That will happen, but yeah. whether this will lead to any medium or long-term uh, gains, yeah. uh, I am very, very uh, doubtful. Okay. But one point I want to add that's important. You see, the other side, we have a very people extremely experienced in sustaining hostility towards India for 70 years. And they are going to not be judged by Minister Modi by so-called uh, goodwill gestures. But what is it that is prompting him to do this? Yeah. And uh, there, unfortunately, I find yeah. that the Pakistanis are uh, reading the whole thing in a way that's not going to open any okay. doors because they think he's been weakened because after the Bahar elections that he has no choice, he realized there's no choice but to talk to Pakistan and there's external pressure, okay. which means from the Pakistani side, yeah. there'll be no give on their fundamental position. They'll expect actually concessions from okay. the Mr. Quickly, Modi. Because I yes, need to, um, to... I, I think uh, Prime Minister has also uh, learn on the job. And I think Mr. Modi has taken time to uh, come to certain conclusions about Pakistan. He has perhaps concluded that there's no option but to have a dialogue. Okay. And he's investing in the dialogue. Okay. So I, I think it's a good move. All right. We have to wait and see okay. what happens. Uh, Ambassador Mukherjee, do you think that Prime Minister Modi has also fallen into the same legacy trap that his, that his predecessors did? That he wants to make historic changes and wants to be known as somebody who changed the relationship with Pakistan fundamentally, rather than following a, a, a gradual policy of improving ties and treating Pakistan as a normal nation? I mean, I have never known him to go to Sri Lanka to hug the president on his... Uh, uh, a birthday or, you know, go to Bangladesh on Sheikh Hasina's birthday? Well, you know, the, the legacy trap uh, is, is, is a real uh, fear. Uh, I won't deny that. I don't think anyone will deny that. I hope not. And, and I think all of us, all, all Indians who, who worry about the future uh, of Indo-Pakistan relations would hope not. I think I'm not really worried about U-turns and so on. Uh, foreign policy is a very dynamic thing. International relations are very dynamic. And like Emerson said, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. The only consistent thread in foreign policy, as far as I'm concerned, okay. is the pursuit of national interest. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, Mr. Sibyl, where do we stand in our relationship with Afghanistan? President Ashraf Ghani, ever since he assumed the presidency, has been sort of wanting to improve ties with uh, Pakistan because he thinks Pakistan alone can help him uh, settle with the Taliban. And now, after this uh, Heart of Asia and Istanbul Process uh, Conference, the U.S. and China have again put Pakistan at the center of things and told Afghanistan that, look, Mr. Nawaz Sharif is the man who will help you talk to the uh, Taliban. Now, how can India maintain its relationship with Taliban and leverage the investment it has made, not only physical, but uh, in terms of uh, its friendship and consistent friendship with Afghanistan to stabilize that country? Do we have a role at all? No, we have a role, but it's not a... It's not the most important role because we don't have contiguity with Afghanistan. Uh, we don't have easy access to Afghanistan. And we don't want to get uh, drawn into the quagmire there because other powers have experienced uh, reverses in Afghanistan, political, military, security and otherwise. So yeah. the more you get involved in it, the more pressure there would be to help Afghanistan more. And it will become a never-ending story. That is one aspect. Uh, the uh, other is that... Uh, the, there is now a complete breakdown of trust and, in fact, dialogue between Afghanistan and Pakistan. At the leadership level, President Ghani has actually been very seriously rebuffed uh, in his expectations by the Pakistanis. 
it will take a long time to restore that kind of, kind of a dialogue. Does this give us any opportunity to insert ourselves into the process? I think the fact that he visited Afghanistan and made an excellent speech to the parliament and raised all the issues, in fact, quite severely criticized Pakistan's role in Afghanistan. You're talking about Prime Minister Modi's speech. Prime in, Minister in Modi's speech. Uh, I think there's, there's a signal that we are players and we will, intend to, we will intend to continue to bolster Afghanistan. And the fact that four helicopters have been given, we are moving on supplying military aid, is a major step okay. that, that we are taking. So all in all, we have a role, but I would say it's a limited role. You wanted to say something? Yes, uh, as somebody who has served in Afghanistan, I'd like to add my comments. Firstly, we have recovered a lot of lost ground in Afghanistan. And the reason why our relations soured with Afghanistan was partly our own fault. Because having signed a strategic partnership agreement, we hesitated on giving Afghans what they needed most. What did they need? They needed trucks, helicopters, and so on. And we were reluctant to supply those. Now, uh, also when President Ghani came, he looked towards Pakistan because obviously Pakistan is more important for solving their problems. But President Ghani has also come around to view India as a friend after having been revoked by Pakistan and seeing that Pakistan doesn't deliver. So his recent trip actually has made India now a much more important player in Afghanistan than it was in okay. the last couple of years. Okay. All right. We need to take a break again at this point. We'll be back again in a bit. Stay with us. Don't go away. Welcome back. We're discussing India's relationship with its neighbors in the year gone by. Uh, Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee, we say that our relationship with Bangladesh has really flourished this year. You know, the land boundary agreement, right. uh, the handing over of Anup Chetia, uh, connectivity agreements, the $2 billion credit line that India has given. Uh, but within Bangladesh, uh, there are disturbing developments, the growth of Islamic fundamentalism, people who are to the right of jamaat e islami uh, so how does India propose to deal with the growth of Islamic fund fundamentalism in Bangladesh? Because it can very easily cross over into India, as we saw in the case of the Bardwan blasts. I would say two things. One, uh, certainly you're right. I mean, there, there is a rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Bangladesh, as is the case in many other countries in the world. Uh, I would <clears> say <throat> we, uh, you know, uh, the only way we can protect ourselves from... Uh, this crossing the border into and, and, and being a, a worry for us. See, and this applies to all our neighbors, frankly. In, in, in such things, we can only do it with the willing cooperation of the government of Bangladesh. We cannot do these things unilaterally. Okay. And therefore, yeah. the, the answer is only to develop friendly relations with that country in yeah. every way possible. Okay. Mas Sibul, uh, do you agree with this? Because, we, we, you know, uh, the, the containment of Islamic fundamentalism has to be a national effort. You can't have, uh, you know, some political parties being completely kept out of any kind of political dialogue. I'm not saying have an early election. Uh, but do you think India can play a facilitating role in getting the Bangladesh uh, Nationalist Party and the Awami together and have a dialogue at least on containing Islamic fundamentalism, because with that kind of a growth, the prospect for any dem democratic politics would diminish over time. You see, if there is such severe polarization within a country as we have in Bangladesh, if you intervene, uh, on whose side are you <coughs> intervening when the both sides are not willing to actually have a reasonable dialogue with each other? What you will be signaling is that you don't fully support the government in power without actually being able to do anything very much for the opposition. So you should actually assess how much weight and influence you have and what capacity you have actually to change the mindset of the political classes there and work them towards some kind of cohabitation in the real sense. I think we should be very careful uh, about these things. And so far as the rise of fundamentalism is concerned, this is a phenomenon that is affecting the Islamic world. And I don't think that if Bangladesh uh, has uh, this kind of development on the ground, it poses us any more serious a threat than we actually face uh, from the Western side. In fact, in pa from Pakistan, there's far greater threat to us about the spillover effects of radicalization than from Bangladesh. Okay. On Bangladesh, and then I want to yeah. ask you about Sri Lanka. Yeah, because, because you see, uh, the reason why our Bangladesh policy was in shambles, UPA2, was because we couldn't control the internal politics in India. The Tista agreement, for instance, was sabotaged because we didn't have an understanding with the West Bengal government. I think this is the challenge for the government now, to make sure that West Bengal 
is on board on the, on the right side uh, on the same page so that we can proceed with a lot of projects where bangladesh will benefit that will strengthen the hands of sheikh hasina okay. and give us those benefits okay but uh, what about sri lanka do you think after the uh, the defeat of mahinda rajapakshe and the coming in of betri palas sri sena india's interests in sri lanka will be taken more effectively on board both in terms of security and in terms of devolving parts power, power to the tamil so that sri lanka itself gets stabilized yeah but there's there's also a, a, a tight rope walking in sri lanka like like we have seen in the case yeah. of nepal uh we have the right environment now sri sena and ranil vikramasinghe understand the relationship and the importance of india and so it is going on the right lines but we shouldn't be overtly pro tamil because to some extent we should let them resolve their issues uh what we should actually do is where they contrast us with china we make promises takes a long time to fulfill our promises to do projects on the ground that's where implementation is important mm -hmm. but i think we have started on the right foot yeah. and we have opened a new chapter with sri lanka yeah. um as i said earlier you said that we have never interfered in maldives that is true um but how how has the political volatility in uh, maldives affected our ties with them because you know the prime minister in his uh, Im immediately after uh, his uh, swearing in went on a tour of indian ocean countries avoided maldives a lot of people said if he had gone there then nasheed would uh, the former president would not be in uh, jail today but whenever uh, maldives has been in a crisis india has reacted you, the last being the the water crisis where india uh, you know uh, flew in four uh, il 24s with full of water to uh, to maldives set up two ships with desalination plants there so that maldives overcomes that crisis yet when the indian foreign minister was there the president's office issues a statement uh, warning all nations in general not india not to interfere in maldives affairs what does it mean well i think we have a big problem on our hands uh, my own view is that uh, we have to politically engage maldives at very high level yeah. i mean <coughs> it's fact that it's a small country shouldn't mean that it it can be neglected uh, political engagement at high level constantly is very important because that's the only way you can actually drill some sense into into them and their leadership and the and and advise them on the management of their internal politics if it is left to bureaucrats or Uh, or junior political levels is not going to help uh, this is a challenge uh, th th that we face but the problem all the deep rooted problem is simply this that uh, if you interfere then you are like liable to be accused of big brotherly attitude hegemony and this and that as it is they move pretty close to uh, china and china is eyeing them and just like in the case on nepal they play the china card against us so it's difficult if you ignore them then your interests get uh, affected adversely so how to find the right balance yeah. and the only way actually is political engagement okay. at high level so i've got one question for all of you so quick answers as mm -hmm. we are running out of time which which is that what do you think are going to be the major uh, foreign <coughs> policy challenges in india's neighborhood in 2016 will nepal get resolved i think so i i think nepal will get resolved because i doubt if the nepali uh, the unholy coalition that is in power right now okay uh will be able to sustain their their policies for too long okay ambassador they'll continue to be ups and downs you know no major country like of the size of india uh which has surrounded by smaller neighbors is able to maintain uh problem free relations in the neighborhood this is russia china china has no friends so you, even united states has difficulties with canada and mexico and of course terrible difficulties okay. cuba latin america okay. therefore we have to live with this reality and we shouldn't okay. have this romantic notion that we can manage our neighborhood or that is absolutely necessary for us to become a big power yeah. okay. all the other countries have become big powers with difficulties in their okay. neighborhood we can live with the problem okay what's your what's your well I, i think number one we should stop being coercive or openly coercive in relations with our neighbors because no matter whether you're right or wrong the perception will be that you're bullying them but i thought we no. spent half an hour discussing that we've not been coercive mm -hmm. no i mean the perception of being coercive Perse that's that's something to do. secondly we haven't invested enough in the neighborhood the fact that china is becoming a factor china is becoming a factor also because china is actually investing large amounts of money in the infrastructure in our neighborhood and surely that's something that we can also match and perhaps do better uh second thirdly uh personal diplomacy is important and sometimes there have been large long patches 
when we don't meet the, lab, the leaders of the neighborhood. And I think Mr. Modi is doing right in focusing on the neighborhood and maintaining that kind of personal relationship. Okay. All right. So we've run out of time. We'll have to end this discussion here. I'd like to thank all of you. Ambassador Shivshankar Mukherjee, Ambassador Kaval Sibul, Ambassador Lalit Ban Singh, thank you very much indeed for coming here and participating in this discussion. That's all we have for you today. We'll be back again next week with our overall roundup for the year. Till then, goodbye and thanks for watching India's work.